wonderful opportunity. All right, so um, today we're talking about eating your way out of virtually any disease. Food as medicine. And that's truly what it is. If you think of the Bible, the first thing that, that God did was he created people. And then he said, here's how you eat. And so much of the Bible is even based on just a cookbook. It tells people the simplicities of how to eat, how to make food. And we really have lost touch with that. And we went from God food to man food. Man started saying, I can make it better, faster, and cheaper. And when we did that, we have really suffered the consequences. So food as medicine. So you guys don't know me, and I don't know most of you guys. I know a few guys. Um, so, you know, one question a patient had when I first started practice, and I was new, and I was like, I'm a doctor, you know. Um, she actually said, so what qualifies you to help me? And I thought, gosh, I thought just graduating was enough, you know, passing boards and all that. So I uh, make sure to let you guys know that when I talk, that I hopefully know what I'm talking about. So the fact that you guys don't know me, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. And I have um, completed a, a number of lifestyle medicine programs. Uh, my, my favorite ones are through Harvard Medical School. And they, again, it's one of the few continuing education programs where they just don't say, if you have a problem, prescribe more meds, refer out, cut it out. So it's a wonderful opportunity uh, and there's very few of these schools that are actually promoting this as a lifestyle medicine. Did a, several through Yale University School of Medicine, and a lot of that is on uh, weight and health promotion. Um, uh, certifications, diplomates. Um, have a diplomate from the American Board of Functional Medicine. Um, diplomate from the American Association of, Association of Integrated Medicine. Uh, senior fellow at the Academy of Functional Medicine, and membership of several different organizations. And I serve on the chairman of the board of directors uh, for the Academy of Functional Medicine, and as the immediate past president, kind of the liaison for the uh, American Board of Functional Medicine that certifies doctors in, in this. I, uh, for several years, taught out in Colorado, and I actually taught physicians how to do lifestyle medicine. Uh, back then, we called it functional medicine and clinical nutrition. And for two years, these doctors would come every month and listen to me for 12 to 16 hours. And we would teach them how to reverse all these major problems simply by changing lifestyle. And then I actually taught a applied nutrition and clinical chemistry program after that all throughout the country. And so we taught a lot of doctors um, how to interpret laboratory results and then how to prescribe nutrition uh, in a proper way. And of course, I have my practice in Newton, and I actually have patients all over the country that we uh, do health coaching through and even have a patient in Europe now. So, food is medicine. And really what we're talking about is conventional wisdom versus exceptional wisdom. Because all medicine, all modern medicine was food. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, said medicine is food and food is medicine. And that was modern medicine for thousands of years until westernized medicine came up with a new idea. We would take something that worked in nature, like willow bark, that God made, and we would extract out part of that, synthesize it, patent it, and sell it back to people sell something that came free in nature and synthesize it so it's not natural anymore, but I can make a profit off of it. And we call that aspirin. And aspirin became one of the first pharmaceuticals uh, in the United States. And from there, they found out it's highly profitable. Then they went through for several years and taught people, mostly the physicians, that your grandma was wrong, that your parents are wrong, that naturopaths are wrong that everybody that has prescribed nutrition is wrong. The only cure is pharmaceuticals. Not food, that's quackery. Not vitamins, that's quackery. And luckily, within the U.S., we have really gotten to this point where people are just exhausted and tired of 
that conventional wisdom that if you get sick, take a drug, mask the symptom, and then you get nutrient depletion, you get side effects, you take more drugs, and before long we have an average geriatric population that's on a minimum of 10 drugs. And people are tired of that. And so people are seeking something greater and better for that, and we get our exceptional wisdom. So I ask you a question. Conventional wisdom for fishing. How many of you guys in here have been fishing? Right? Fishing's awesome. Uh, if you catch fish, it's even better, right? <laughs> the conventional wisdom says you buy a rod, reel, get a line, get some bait, put it on a hook, and you sit there and wait and wait and wait. And you catch a fish. So is there another way? Is there a more exciting way? Is there a better way? Well, exceptional wisdom would be this kind of fishing. You drive around a boat and fish jump into your boat. Have you guys ever seen this? Some of these pictures are from Kansas. This one's, uh, I think, from Missouri, and there's a couple pictures from Illinois. And think about this. Conventional wisdom says you can't catch a fish like this. If I told my friends I just drove around the lake and fish jumped in, they wouldn't believe you. And that's really what it is with conventional wisdom of medicine versus that exceptional wisdom of food. When you tell people, stop eating all that horrible stuff you're eating that's highly processed, stop drinking stuff that's flavored with gasoline, stop eating from plastic that's made from gasoline, stop coloring food with gasoline. How can we consume, eat, drink, and breathe, and rub gasoline products on our skin and, and they'd be surprised that we don't feel good? But that's conventional. And so when you talk about exceptional wisdom, about food as medicine, nobody's going to believe you. And the only people that are really responsive are the ones who are just sick and tired of the same old, same old. They want exceptional. They want something different. And I've got to say, can you see the little boat? I would be going nuts out there. <laughs> I would love that. You see this guy? He likes the exceptional. He's getting hit by fish. In fact, on some of these rivers, when you're going through, the fish are so big that jump into the boat that they hit and knock people out of the boat. Now, that's more fair fishing to me, right? And this is Kansas here. And you can see the driver looking over at the fish sailing next to him. And then this guy's using his oar to guide him in. Again, exceptional wisdom. I can use an oar to fish. You'd think that person is crazy. <laughs> and here they're using nets. That's smarter. Get, get more. So we're going to talk about conventional versus exceptional. What has conventional led us to? In the U.S., are we the healthiest country in the world? Do we spend more than any other country in the world on health care? We pay more, but we're not getting more. And we ended up taking things like heart disease, cancer, and stroke and making them epidemics. We all have to die sometime, but there's what's called the rectangular lifespan. I develop really fast, I have a great life, and I suddenly die when I'm ready to die. And instead, we have, I'm born, I live through my 20s and feel really great, and then I feel horrible, 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 and I suffer, 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 and then I finally get put out of my misery. That's not exceptional. And we just accept this as the American model. So we have heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes. Those are the main ones that we're going to focus on today because those are the main ones that you're going to know. And these are no different within the Christian community than the non-Christian community. All people suffer the same because we all share the same physiology. What happens in churches that I've been to is we eat a bunch of Twinkies and we pray over the food for health and wellness. And it doesn't work. You look at this, we go from rare to epidemic. So something like cancer. Cancer used to be 1 in 8,000. Think about that. 1 in 8,000. An absolute rarity. And it's not that we didn't know what cancer was, because we know what cancer was 
even back when they wrote on papyrus paper. It was found in the tombs with the mummies that they had cancer. So it's not that we didn't know what this was. And it's not that we have sudden technology to, to know what these things are. But it's we changed our lifestyle. So 1 in 8,000, and in 1972, cancer was the skyrocketed to the 10th leading cause of disease. And President Nixon declared a war on cancer. We are going to pour trillions of dollars into researching and finding that miracle cure that's eluding us for this cancer epidemic. And just 20, 30, 40 years later, it's now one in two. World Health Organization predicted that if you live in America, you eat like an American, you breathe like an American, and you rub stuff on your skin like an American, you're going to get cancer in your lifetime. And they predicted the rate was going to go to one in one. Every single American will get cancer in their lifetime. And sure enough, that prediction came true. The World Health Organization and the CDC now claim that the rate, the rate is one in one. And is cancer an ageism disease? If we just live longer, we're going to all get cancer? And I would refute that because we're actually getting cancer younger and younger. The leading cause of death from our women 20 to 40 years of, old, 20 to 40 years of age is cancer. Young women in their prime dying from cancer. And in fact, children, one in 500 by age 15 will have brain cancer. One in 500. Now cancer is a hard enough thing to get. Cancer in a child in the prime of their life is an absolute insanity to get. And then one out of three children will just have one cancer. Leukemia. Or sorry, one out of three, yeah. One out of three childhood cancers will be leukemia. And the number one chemical all the way back to 1939 I have textbooks from 1939 that say that the cause of this is benzene. And benzene is a chemical that we absolutely know causes cancer. It's made from gasoline. And what we do with that knowledge is we put it in your food. We use it as a preservative. And in fact, a lot of health companies will actually use sodium benzoate, which is benzene, in these special juices. And so they'll have a miracle juice, a certain berry from, you know, some rare country. And then they take that wonderful thing and they contaminate it with something that's going to disrupt the DNA in your bone marrow. Heart disease, one and two. Now heart disease has always been the leading cause of disease pretty much for the last hundred years. There's a few times when it dropped off, but pretty much it's always been the same. The difference is we kill 18 times more people than we did 100 years ago. Is it an ageism thing? If we live long enough, we're all going to die of a heart attack? We are seeing heart attacks younger and younger and younger. In fact, age 50 is the key criteria, the key age to be worried. And now we see people not only getting a bypass at 49, but people getting quintuple bypasses at 49. And that's amazing because we never saw that before. We actually see in studies where they, they took uh, biopsies from children's uh, arteries and they find foam cells. And foam cells are the precursors to atherosclerosis or the placking of arteries. We're causing it in children now because the children are eating worse than we were at their age. Children. There's actually a study on, uh, there's a condition called non-alcoholic um, non fatty liver disease. Now most people get fatty liver from either hepatitis or chronic alcoholism. We can now do it in food. We can now achieve that, that took years and years of chronic alcoholism, and we can create that in a 10-year-old child now in the matter of five years, which means those kids are going to be at a huge risk of liver failure. Diabetes, which is one of my favorites. My dad actually died of type 2 diabetes in his late 50s. Not before he lost a foot. 
another foot, a leg, another leg, and then he finally died of a pulmonary embolism. And it's everyone now. It went from absolute rare. In fact, really before 1959, there was no type 2 diabetes. With the food system as bad as it was in 1959, you couldn't achieve type 2 diabetes. And it went from rare to one out of three. If you include prediabetes in there, it's one out of two people in the United States now. In fact, every child born after the year 2000, one in three will be diabetic in their lifetime, type 2 diabetic. If they're not white, they're black, Hispanic, the rate is one in two. And of course, obesity and overweight, which it used to be a very, very rare thing, is now three out of four. And 80% of those people that are overweight will become diabetic. So what's going to happen if we keep doing the same thing? You guys know the definition of insanity by Albert Einstein? If we keep doing the same thing, why would we expect something different? But we truly do. We keep spending billions of dollars researching sick people to see what the effects of all this stuff does to our body. And I like to say I've, I've really transitioned over the years to where if there was 10 people and five were sick and five were healthy, they all share the same genetics. They all share the same genetics. I would rather spend the trillions of dollars staying with the healthy people, what the resilient people are doing, to not be sick in the same society. And in this society, you know the only population that is the healthiest population? It's you guys. Loma Linda, California is the blue zone, the healthiest, longest living population in the United States of America. And I don't think it's because you guys take more medications, have more surgeries. Now, in the idea of creating, through conventional wisdom, these epidemics, so I keep using the word epidemics, we've created something from scratch, made it common, and rose it to epidemic proportions, and then act surprised about this. Take something like cancer, prostate cancer for men, it really started with the advent of the use of pesticides after World War II. We took chemicals that killed people. They didn't want to go out of business after the war. So let's make things that kill little things, like insecticides, fungicides. And we'll spray those on the crops. We'll let you spray those in your house. And things that you, that say, if you drink this, you will die. We'll just spray a little bit in the house, right? Then we breathe that stuff in. And with the advent, there's a great book called The Hundred Year Lie. And it's a wonderful thing because it timelines. No disease, we add this chemical. Suddenly we saw prostate cancer. What do we do with that information? We add more chemicals. Prostate goes up 300%. We add more chemicals. And now we're to this point and everybody seems to think that it's genetic. But if you look at that, that's 1981. That's not like 1900. That's not that far ago. Heart, heart attack and strokes, 109 years of those. You can see that 1900s, it was very rare. Now, a lot of people will say, well, we didn't live that long in 1900. And that's not true. We went through this at a 16-hour course in Colorado where we looked at all the CDC's information, all the ages, and adjusted for all that. And you would have lots of children dying, which then if you took the average, the average person only lived to 50 years old. But there were lots of people over 50. It was just displaced by the fact that you had so many children that did not make it into childhood. So over here, you see little dips, and you start to see a decline in 1990. And that's not because we suddenly changed our diet. That's not because we gave away conventional wisdom and said, let's be exceptional, let's live healthy. In 1972, there's a doctor that showed you could reverse heart disease in one month. One month. Landmark studies. And we did nothing with that because surgery is very, very profitable. Very profitable for you to be sick. 
This is from surgeries. This is bypass surgeries. That's the only cure we have. Chop veins out of your leg, sew them onto your heart. Keep eating what you're eating. The epidemic of diabetes, really since 1960, has been slowly progressing, and then we are seeing this dramatically, or dramatic incline. Probably right about the time super size proportions came in, maybe. The epidemic of something like diverticulosis. It's the same as if we were talking about irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's syndrome. They're all basically the same. We're eating, we're killing off our bacteria and eating stuff that irritates us, and then we get a label. Diverticulosis, are we suddenly genetically getting more, uh, pre you know, uh, genetically altering our DNA and creating these things? Or is our diet making this? 1950, barely any, and of course up to the 90s, it's epidemic. Same thing with MS. You can see 1984, and that's a critical age for this. But multiple sclerosis is a, basically um, uh, a me omega-3 versus omega-6 difference. But it's also things like aspartame that create autoimmune disorders. In 1984 is a, a really important date for that because in 1984, aspartame was started to be put in soda. And we introduced diet soda. And it all fell apart from there. So aspartame becomes formaldehyde at 87 degrees. And we all start drinking formaldehyde, which is made from gasoline. And then we're surprised that we get things like these new diseases. And this is interesting. I mean, like, when I was in school, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, those were considered made-up diseases. Patients were just complaining. We'd put them in psych meds. When I went to did my medical clerkships, same thing. Is this real? Is it not real? Because our textbooks didn't have this stuff in there. We didn't know what these things were. These were things that we caused. We had no you know, longevity of study to know how to even deal with this, how to diagnose it correctly. And so we came up with these criteria, but we have no idea what the disease is. But it happened the same year that we released diet soda. Autism, same thing. Autism was extremely, extremely rare, especially I think the first case was uh, the, f the year after we did the first vaccine. The next year we had the first case of autism and then exploded from that. Um, in fact, studies are showing now it's probably unlikely that it's only vaccines because it follows the experimental studies of BT, corn. So where we made genetically modified food, we would see autism spring up in those areas. And in countries that did not vaccinate, we saw genetically modified food being tested, and we saw autism skyrocket in those areas. Areas that have never seen it before, suddenly it was there. And look at that. I mean, that is insane. And it went from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 500 in just a short time. And now it's below 1 in 110 as of 2009. What is the projection? Let's just continue this. Let's say we do conventional wisdom. We don't know what's causing it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't panic. What's the projection of this? Soon one out of one children in the U.S. will have autism. If you eat like an American, drink like an American, don't live in Loma Linda, California, then every single child is going to have autism? I mean, at what point do we say this is enough? This is unacceptable. Now, this is an interesting one. It's your CDC fat map. As the color gets darker, we get fatter. <laughs> So the yellow is 20 to, 5, 20 to 24 percent. Now we're hitting 25. Now we're hitting 30. And this only goes up to 2009. And after 2009, we expanded it to have another category called 35 percent. Is there any question that this is not genetic? This is not something that's always been around. 
This is something that we are slowly causing and creating. Two thousand six. That became a really important year. Does anybody know what happened in two thousand six? Probably a lot. When I was in school, we were taught about the dangers of smoking. Smoking caused lung cancer, especially there's studies, linear studies that basically, uh, whenever you started, 20 years you can expect to have cancer. Smoking has 5,000 toxins in it. You breathe those in, you get toxic, and you slowly mutate DNA until you get cancer, and then you die. Seems like an easy concept to believe. In 2006, Smoking no longer became the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. What replaced it? Food. Food replaced it. What we eat became more dangerous than inhaling 5,000 toxic chemicals. Because we were now eating 5,000, 10,000 toxic chemicals. Your average apple now is sprayed with 200 pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. By the time it gets to the store, the USDA will do tests on there, and it's down to 46. That's not too shabby, except those are endocrine disrupting, DNA mutating, and they cause fertility issues. I actually had a patient the other day that had um, arrhythmias, and he changed his diet, and he got better, and he got off his meds, and then he ate an apple, and suddenly he had an arrhythmia again. We looked at the apple. It's not organic. Do those chemicals cause arrhythmias? And sure enough, almost every single one of those pesticides residues that are on there are ones that would cause it. He's not only eating one, but he's eating 46 different chemicals that would cause it. So conventional wisdom... Cancer rates, prostate and breast, is now above smoking. And that's estrogens from plastic and dairy. They are now more dangerous to eat and drink out of plastic and drink milk than it is to smoke. Same thing with colon. We took all the fiber out of the food so you could cook food faster. You could cook rice in five minutes instead of 20 minutes, and then we get colon cancer. There's a reason we have fiber in the food, and fiber feeds 700 different bacteria that live on you. You guys think you're awesome, right? We're this cool individual. We are only one-twelfth of the living beings that live in us and on us. For every one cell in our body, God made 12 bacteria to take care of us. That's three pounds of your body weight. Next time you stand on the scalp, think, whatever you weigh, just take three pounds off, because that's just your friends hanging out taking care of you. <laughs> the key is all these are preventable. We could wipe out cancer by stop doing what we're doing. So let's look at exceptional wisdom. Let's look at food as medicine, making choices based on health and wellness versus pleasure and enjoyability. The exceptional wisdom doesn't let you fall down those cracks. You take the blue zone places, these, these areas all over the U.S. There's a great book called The Blue Zone. It started as a U.S. Uh, or a National Geographic's article, and it was so popular it became a book. And it talks about places like Sardinia, Okinawa, Loma Linda, and there's several others, but these are the healthiest places in the world. And they don't do... PX90 there. They don't do low carb, you know, high fat, low fat, sugar free. They don't do any of that stuff there. They have adopted a quality of life that involves relaxation, purposeful movement, and eating food like it's medicine. Now they don't know it. They just don't eat like we do. And you can see the commonalities. And the wonderful thing is not every country even eats and does the same things. But there is so much nutrition within all the different foods. It just doesn't take that much for us to get healthy, to not be sick, to get over diseases. All this food that we have is packed with nutrition. 
And you can see the core things that they all share, which is nice too. So beyond genetics, this is some of the reasons I feel like I can say this in such conviction to you guys. We had a patient who was 15 years old, said he had genetic cancer. He had several genetic tests that showed that he had a genetic mutation at Q34.1 on his chromosome. So every time his cells turned out, they turned over mutated cells. The cause most likely is benzene for this kid. He goes to his doctor, cancer doctor, they say, you got a mutated chromosome, conventional wisdom says, you'll get cancer, it's inevitable, and when you do, we'll do chemo, and it's probably not likely that you'll survive. His mom had come to a talk a long time ago, came to me and said, well, what do you think? And I said, I think we can beat this, because the body's resilient, because we turn on and off genes every single day by the food choices that we make. You can literally think to turn off and on your genes, positive versus negative thinking. But more importantly, things like ginger, turmeric, those are foods that actually turn on genes and silence cancer genes. We can actually reverse genetic mutation by this process. And we had six months before he got his new genetic testing through bone marrow aspiration. Six months to prove that I, what I believe, as an exceptional wisdom of food as medicine, it will work. And lo and behold, on October, in October, he got his new bone marrow, and 100% of all those cells were normal DNA. For the first time in any of the testing, it was normal DNA. And if you... Most people think everything's genetic. It's not. If you have it in your family, it's because you do what your mom did, which what her mom did. And if you do the same thing, you're going to get the same result. Of the 3 to 5% of things that are probably genetic, who cares? We can reverse that too. You literally choose every time you eat, reverse genetics, destroy genetics. So mutated genes, change the diet. Stop exposing yourself to chemicals that mutate. DNA, and restore it and live a long, healthy life. We have a patient that has autoimmune disease up in uh, Massachusetts. She got diagnosed. They are bewildered by this. She has all these um, autoimmune markers. They're all skyrocketing, and they think that she has lupus. And so basically, her doctor said the same thing. You got autoimmune. We're going to give you steroids. If that doesn't work, we'll shut down your immune system and you'll probably get sick and they probably get really fat from the steroids and then die. We said no. The body's resilient. Let's stop doing what causes autoimmune. Let's eat foods that reverse autoimmune. And interestingly enough, she came in with testing from a rheumatologist and she was getting tested the next week or maybe two weeks, I think it was two weeks later. Two weeks later, her rheumatologist was confounded. All her autoimmune markers, her ANA, her CRP, they were all normal. And luckily, she goes to a doctor, a rheumatologist, that was like, awesome, keep doing that. You're doing awesome. I don't know how this works, but just keep doing it. So that was a wonderful thing. And people will suffer years and years and years. And people will suffer needlessly and die prematurely solely based on what their doctor doesn't know. And that's why in the beginning, I talk about all those things, all those educational experiences, and that's just a drop in the bucket. You have to know and learn and learn and learn. There's always more and more options. When you open that tool bag, you want hundreds of tools in there. And more likely than not, you want food in those tools. Irritable bowel, Crohn's. Uh, we have several patients like that, but we had a 40-year-old woman that had it for 20 years. She's a long-distance runner, and having to go to the bathroom a lot kind of makes it hard to be a very competitive <laughs> runner. 20-year-old student had Crohn's disease, and again, they were perplexed about what to do. Usually, you just give them steroids, shut down their immune system. They bloat up really big, and they feel pretty miserable. But we did something different. 
We said if it's chronic, it's something you're chronically eating, drinking, breathing, rubbing on your skin. It is a toxicity. It is, you killed those three pounds of bacteria. Let's just restore what's supposed to be there. Eat what you're supposed to eat. Don't eat what you shouldn't eat. And something amazing happens. And it only took a couple weeks, which is kind of messed up because this other doctor got paid for 20 years. <laughs> a managing her, which is 80% of all healthcare is just to manage people, manage chronic conditions. And in a couple of weeks, I lost a patient. <laughs> She's better, you know? And it's not that difficult to keep being better because she just stops doing what she was doing before and keeps doing what she's doing now. Diabetes is a pretty easy one. Diabetes is uh, not a disease. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal diet. We can't eat 15 pounds of sugar a month and expect that our body will work. But lo and behold, if we stop eating 15 pounds of sugar a month, our body starts working. So it's not a disease. But we had this woman who was 43. She had type 2 diabetes. She had insulin, the maximum amount of insulin she could get, and her fasting glucose was 500. Her A1C was unreadable. I didn't even know that was possible, but it was so high it was unreadable. And it took about a couple weeks for her to call and say, I woke up with normal blood sugars. No medication, just lived a life consistent with life and longevity. So, those are, those are the things I get excited about. This is why I love this topic. Now, if it didn't work, then I would... <laughs> I wouldn't be so enthusiastic, I guess. So, food is medicine. Food is medicine. We're going to talk about eating your way out of heart disease, cholesterol, diabetes. And so I'm going to give you some just kind of food ideas here. Foods that naturally improve these things. Mark Twain said, the doctor of the future will give no medicine. No medicine. But will interest his patients in the care of human frame and diet and the cause and prevention of disease not chronically managing the same disease for 20 years, but to change the diet, to address the diet. So something like heart disease. In 2009, now in 1972, we learned that we could reverse heart disease in one month, right? We could stop angina in two weeks by changing diet, stress, and exercise. Well, lifestyle came out, uh, or sorry, prevention came out from a study from Boston University and it showed that we could reverse heart disease by 92%. The number one killer we could eliminate through five insane, crazy things. A healthy diet, that's crazy. Some exercise, that's, un that's intolerable. Have a healthy body weight, that's just unacceptable. Not smoking, I don't know. And moderate amount of alcohol. And the only reason alcohol is from the grapes. So if you eat the dark, don't eat green grapes, eat red grapes, purple grapes. The darker, the more nutrient antioxidant rich it is. The more benefit you get from it. 92%. And what do we do with that information? Nothing. You have countries like Crete that eat the most fat out of any other country. The lowest heart attack rates. And yet in America, we're told fat equals heart disease. And of course, that's Dean Ornish, 1972, showed you could reverse that. First, now heart, basically there's three parts that you've got to manage in, in reversing any disease. You have to reduce stress. That's important. Probably not banging your head, but living a life that's more resilient. So... Um, prayer time, watching the fish tank, taking walks, finding those ways to say, I'm so important, my health is important, I am going to lower my stress, late, stress every day. There's a study that shows that if you exercise just a half a little hour a day, you can reverse most all disease. There's a further study from Japan that says for every 10 minutes you exercise, you reduce all disease by 12% which means 30 minutes, 10 minutes, three times a day, which we all can do, reduces it by 36%. And 
And of course, diet. Now, the main way you reverse all diseases is eat food. Eat things that once lived and will die very quickly. So fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, and greens, which you guys probably already do. The heart prevention study showed that you could reduce a second heart attack more effectively by eating fish twice a week and lots of fruits and vegetables over just cutting fat in your diet. Like we said, there's countries that eat more fat than we do, but they eat omega-3 fat, anti-inflammatory, anti-arrhythmia, anti omega-3 rich. You can either eat fish or you can eat like a fish, right? Fish eat plants and then we eat the fish. Well, we could just eat seaweed and plants too. And there's a wonderful thing that happens with that is it actually blocks heart disease, blood pressure, nine different ways. So you don't have to take an aspirin. The Harvard Medical School Heart Prevention Study, uh, the focus on that was nuts, garlic, alcohol, and onions. And again, the alcohol is from the dark grapes. That's the main component of that. And that's, you know, Especially when you see the onion and garlic, you'll see the same foods. And, and basically that's those old foods that your mom probably cooked way back when, when people actually chopped stuff up and, and cooked. There's a study that showed the easiest way to reduce angina was to stop drinking alcohol. The easiest way to reduce arrhythmias was to stop drinking coffee. Now most arrhythmias are magnesium deficiency, well outside of coffee, or caffeine is magnesium deficiency, B vitamin deficiencies, coenzyme Q, tin deficiencies, uh, the things that regulate the electro uh, function of the heart, the electrophysiology of the heart. Balancing cholesterol, and again, you don't want to lower cholesterol because cholesterol is awesome. Cholesterol is all the hormones that make you feel awesome. And in fact, vitamin D, very, very important. Everybody's low on it in the U.S. That's cholesterol. Your brain, cholesterol. Testosterone, cholesterol, progesterone, estrogen, cholesterol. Your anti-aging hormone, which is the largest amount of hormone that keeps you young, vibrant, healthy, cholesterol. So we don't want to mess with cholesterol. We want to eat foods that naturally balance cholesterol so you have good, healthy cholesterol and uh, less oxidation of cholesterol. And, of course, you have oats and apples, which are also appetite-suppressant foods. Carrots, which are actually uh, good for gut. Olive oil, which is omega-3. Avocados are rich in oil. Wonderful, wonderful fruit. And of course, almonds, beans, garlic, nuts. Same things. Fruits, nuts, vegetables. There was one study where we raised HDLs, and then they prevent the oxidation of LDLs. And that was mostly through beans. Beans were the cheapest, most effective, and they have always been the cheapest, most effective way to balance your cholesterol. Lipitor is expensive and lowers your vitamin D and your testosterone. Beans are cheap <laughs> and you feel better. The real big concern probably, or at least dietary change that you can make the fastest with balancing cholesterol is to regulate triglycerides, which it's tri, which means sugar, and glycerin means fat, or sorry, sugar. Three sugars, but it's actually three fats and one sugar, so they named it wrong. Just to confuse us. <laughs> but that is refined. A lot of times they'll say that's a measure of fat, but really it's a measure of sugar. And triglycerides, if not burned off, will just become fat for the time that you do exercise later on. Foods that fight clots. Clots are going to be the things that coalesce together and then uh, go through your blood vessels and eventually plug up arteries. Uh, we see this more and more and more in the U.S., not so much other countries. So we want to eat like the other countries do. We want to eat lots of garlic. In fact, garlic has a hundred bioactive chemicals that are antiviral, antiparasitic, antifungal. So a diet high in garlic is going to keep you healthier. If you're really tough and you feel like you're getting sick, just eat some real garlic. Burns a little bit, but toughens you up. 
Uh, Chinese uh, Medical University talked about the benefits of green tea. Green tea actually um, is a epigenetic modifier too. It actually turns on and off genes in your body. Uh, you can actually get decaf green tea through the Swiss method where they cycle it through water and it takes the caffeine out. Or some people do green tea, pour the first batch out. The second one has very little caffeine, but it actually has more tannins in it, which is more nutrition. Swedish study, fruits and vegetables again. They lower fibrinogen, which lowers clotting, which lowers the risk of heart attack and stroke. This is an interesting one. This, this study was in Italy. You know, who, who thinks Italians are stressed out? I mean, it's a beautiful area, you know? Uh, but in Naples, Italy, they had this study where they, they did one little thing. They took people with high blood pressure and they gave them one food. Pick one of these. High potassium foods. That's it. Just eat another food. And after the end of the study, is 12 months, and the reason for these are high potassium foods because you want high potassium, low sodium, but you don't want to mess with sodium because sodium is healthy for you. Sodium is not bad for you. Sodium is wonderful. For, wonderful. Processed foods are packed in sodium. Stop eating processed foods. You get rid of 80% of the excess salt anyways. But potassium is very important. You want a high potassium. If you eat fruits and vegetables, you don't have to worry. They're high in potassium versus sodium. So they picked one of those. And 81% were able to cut their meds in half. Just doing one radical thing, eating a food. 38% could cut off their meds completely. They just added a food. <coughs> Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, leave, in, leave your drugs in a chemist pot if you can heal a patient through food. It should always be food first. The diet should be the main component. And when you look at something like cancer, right? We took something rare, made an epidemic. We run for it. We, we eat Tic Tacs that are pink, that are flavored and colored with gasoline to support the study for the cure of cancer, right? The only people that are studying the cure for cancer are the people running in the cure for cancer. So the anti-cancer diet, you'll notice, to no surprise, that the thing that reverses cancer is what? The same thing we talked about for reversing heart disease. So that's the nice thing, is it isn't rocket science, it isn't complicated. Everybody sells a book out there and they sell the complication of this. But the reality is it isn't that complicated. Eat something that God made, that's a fruit, vegetable, nut, cedar, berry, and that man has intervened the least amount with. So our wonderful, wonderful foods. And it's just like soy. Most of us don't eat soy now. If we eat processed foods, we eat soy isolates and soy particles and soy genetically modified stuff. And so we get the bad stuff, but not the good stuff, like the tofu, the tempeh. And of course we see our fruits, vegetables, citrus, fatty fish, tea. The encouraging cancer diet, I made sure to put that on there. That's the sad diet, the standard American diet. And that's the eat a lot of meats, eat a lot of cheese, eat a lot of fat like an American, you know? Eat like an American, drink like an American, and die like an American. I'm from Texas, too. <laughs> I can't give these talks in Texas because I'm talking anti-meat, anti-dairy. I get kicked out. So we know what encourages cancer. And we know what encourages or reduces the spread of cancer. Our cruciferous vegetables. Those are some of the most important things. The, the, what's called the brassica foods, the kale, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the bok choy. Those are some of the most potent anti-cancer foods you can get, especially for reducing things like breast cancer and prostate cancer. The National Cancer Institute said that we could reduce cancer by people doing something crazy, like eating more fruits and vegetable. It's not unknown. This is not like mystery stuff. Even the people at the top talk about this 
There's tons and tons of research from this. Because it isn't a surprise, but there's no one going around telling your doctor, hey man, eat some oranges, <laughs> right? They have a guy that says, buy these drugs, buy these drugs. And I make 80000 a year to tell you to buy these drugs, buy these drugs. Forget about the food, that's quackery. So it's talk about we can, talks about we can lower the last, or the top three cancer drugs, or cancer causes. And in fact, it even went further and said we could have a 75% reduction in smokers. We could reduce cancer in smokers. Someone who's consuming 5,000 dangerous poisonous chemicals, if they ate more fruits and vegetables, that's how powerful it is. That is how powerful it is. Anything that will prevent will cure. And that's from the China study. It's a wonderful book. So you're not genetically designed to have cancer. It's us. It's what we do. It's our diets what we smoke. Sunlight doesn't even cause cancer. Sunlight, cancers, sunlight causes cancer in the U.S., but only in the last 50 years. If you go overseas, oh, no cancer. Same sun, same body, different diet. It's more likely that you're not getting enough B vitamins, which is from bacteria, which is from the 700 things that are living in you. And of course, occupational factors, chemicals, Radiation, and of course now we found that the radiation that we use to look for cancer is actually causing cancer and the risks are not outweighing the benefits. The anti-cancer diet, soup and salad, <laughs> that's all it is, soup and salad. All these things are packed, I mean you take a carrot, we think a carrot is like beta carotene, a carrot is 200 bioavailable nutrients. It's 10,000 phytonutrients in there. And yet we won't take a carrot, we'll take some beta carotene and eat a hamburger. You can see lots of mint, oregano, even the herbs, the thyme, the chai, the, the, the sage. Those are not only wonderful, powerful antibiotics, antiviral, antifungals, but they're actually making sure we don't have cancer. There was a great study from Minnesota that talks about how we can eat specific ones for specific cancers. So some nutrients are more dense and more effective for a certain cancer than others. So I thought that was pretty good, but again, pretty consistent across the board. If you didn't know this, you would just eat fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and berries. Let your food be your medicine, your medicine be your food. Again, that's Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. Paracelsius, the father of modern pharmacology, said, everything man needs for health and wellness is provided by God in nature. Man's job is to find it. Not find it, synthesize it, patent, and sell it back to you. To find it. The American Diabetes Association, conventional wisdom says, diabetes is a disease, we're going to find this cure, give us more money, we're going to find this cure. They said it's a disease that is not curable. My textbook of endocrinology says diabetes is curable. Of course, they're not fundraising. The cost of being obese or overweight in the U.S., $4,800. So when people talk about it costs too much to be healthy, that's how much it costs to be unhealthy, more so than someone that's being healthy, right? $4,800. 80% of those people become diabetic, and that cost goes to $14,000 extra that you spend just to maintain diabetes. We have our continuum, diabetes to non-diabetes, and one out of two people are here. They're within three to five years of becoming a diabetic if they're a typical American. And of course, there is no surprise how we created this. You think about it, we, we took children's meals, or we took adult meals at McDonald's, adult meals, and call them kitty meals now. And then we eat for four people and we say, why don't I look like one? We eat bags of chips that are for four people and say, I'm eating for four, but I want to look like one. I'm drinking for 12, I want to look like one. The average 15-year-old consumes 800 sodas a year, and they get half their calories from sugar, from soda, every year. So it's all based on glycemic, 
You reverse diabetes easily. You can reverse diabetes in as short as two months. And we've reversed it in weeks. It's just through this. Stop eating all the sugar and the stuff that becomes sugar. Eat things that go very slowly into the blood as glucose. And you reverse diabetes. It's low glycemic. And there's some great low glycemic books in there. And here's a good chart here. So, <laughs> we're running out of time. And um, we'll stop there. But this is your low glycemic chart. And you can see here where we take something like long grain rice that's low glycemic. It's under 55. You will never become diabetic if you eat this. But if we make it instant rice, it becomes sugar. And we guarantee we have diabetes. All right. Thank you, guys. And do you... I'd like to thank you for coming, Dr. Good. And uh, I think we're going to have a little short session of questions and answers. Uh, and we're going to put the green board up here if anybody's got any questions and answers. Okay. We're going to come from you. All right. <laughs> All you. right. <laughs> so you guys have any questions? What was the source of that low glycemic index Mike. chart? Mike. The, the source of the low glycemic index. Yeah, what was the source of the low glycemic index chart? Well, there's, there's a lot of sources online. I mean, I didn't have a specific one. I use a book called uh, Low GI Diet by Rick Gallup. And in there it has those color-coded uh, charts based on glycemic load. And so Rick Gallup's book is a wonderful, wonderful book. It has it all easy for you. Just eat everything on the green list and you're good. <laughs> Most Americans are eating all the red stuff, which guarantees that we become diabetic. Could you uh, say the name of that author in that book again? Oh, Rick Gallup. And, and, uh, and the low GI? Yeah, it's called The Low GI Diet. And there's two books in, like, on Amazon, you can probably get it for a couple bucks used, a few dollars shipping. Uh, there's a small one that's a really great one. It's got some really good information in there, but it's mostly about the color code of the, what's high, high glycemic, low glycemic. Uh, the bigger book that he has has a bunch of recipes in it. Now, the recipes, just because they're low glycemic, doesn't mean they're healthy. They're just based on low glycemia. So gasoline might be low glycemic, and they, they would encourage that. So that one caveat. Yeah. Is, uh, is, there, are, is there any book or books written on what you were talking about, the Blue Zones? Yeah, the, the book is called The Blue Zone. The Blue Zone. Yeah, and I don't, know, I don't remember the author's name, but uh, there's only one book called that. And there's a, you can even look up online the, the article from National Geographic on the Blue Zones. And a wonderful book, again, it's just, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a hard part. The China study says that if a fruit or vegetable is polluted by all the pesticides and herbicides, that's what you're going to eat to get rid of those, to detoxify from those. And if you're only given a choice of you, if you could only afford it or that's all that's available, it's going to still be better than anything else you replace it with. Online, you can look up the USDA's Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. And the dirty dozen are the 12 foods that are the most toxic, the most residues and pollute, pollute, uh, fungicides, herbicides, all that. And then they have the clean 15. And so basically, if you're on a tight budget, you would say, these are the ones I have to buy organic. These are the ones I can kind of risk it on. Organic's always going to be better because it's going to be the safest for you. Um, may we ask about a particular condition? Or sure. Sure. Nail fungus is probably one of the hardest things to fix because people have to do a regime for a long time to fix this because it's under the nail bed. Now, they have this disgusting procedure where they take a blade and cut under your nail and pull it off, and I hated watching those. Now, that would be a lot faster fix because you're already there. Otherwise, you want to, you know, you can use uh, fungus is fed on sugars, and most people are just eating tons and tons of sugars. 
that basically just feed the, the fungus. So we're all exposed to athlete's foot and to, to nail fungus, but most of us don't get it because our immune systems are high enough that it fights it off, or the bacteria that coats our toes are killing off those fungus. Um, otherwise, there's lots and lots of natural treatments for them. Some people just use vinegar. Some people use menthol. Uh, if you put menthol on there, menthol oil, that, you can pull that infected nail right off and it won't, shouldn't hurt. It'll, it'll come off because it'll kill the bacteria underneath of it. Other than that, tea tree oil is wonderful for that. But you've got to do it for months and months and months. And you've got to do it as the new, new nail is growing to ensure that it doesn't become infected during the fragile regrowth process. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. I've got one up front. I was oh. gonna, let me ask a question first because I've got a couple people that didn't want to be on uh, video. <laughs> uh, we talked before about uh, plastic bottles, and I uh, actually went online after I talked to you the first time on it because I didn't, I didn't think you were right about it. <laughs> but I looked it up on, a, what is it, is it called Scoops or Snoops or whatever that yeah, is? Yeah, Snoops. Snoops? Snoops. And uh, there is, it's not estrogen that comes out of that bottle, but it's a, a chemical that mimics estrogen right causes the same problems as estrogen does and so, oh, so. Uh, if you're going to drink out of a plastic bottle make sure it doesn't get in the sun and gets all that heat but it's better not to just drink out of glass and then I had another question maybe it was asked already but this person over here asked me it uh, about eating organic all the time is there, is there some exceptions to that because we're trying to eat all the organic we can I know it's Sometimes two to three times the price. Yeah. And the other looks so good, but it's deceptive food. <laughs> I know. Even buying, you know, even myself, we buy apples and it's just like, oh, it's got these bruises or it's just, they're imperfect. But that's the way food should look like is if you go somewhere and all the food looks exactly the same, there's something wrong with that. It's a science experiment at this point. Um, yeah, organic is going to probably be more of a financial decision more than anything. Now, growing your own food is the easiest way, and crop sharing with other people where you grow things that you're really good at growing, they grow things, and then you can and jar those things. Uh, so you're less dependent upon making those decisions at the grocery store of, okay, what do I poison myself with today, <laughs> right? And you can use things like pyrethrin and, uh, and some of these natural um, pesticides and herbicides that are non-toxic. They're made from chrysanthemum oil. Uh, they're just wonderful, and you know, uh, neem is a really good one, um, and that will decrease your your uh, dependent dependence on uh, trying to buy organic or inorganic. Yeah, I'm wondering what you say about cooked foods. Now, some foods are totally inedible unless they're cooked, like beans and that sort of thing, some legumes. But what about veggies? Uh, what do you re recommend on a lot of veggies? As far does cooking impact the uh, Benefit they have? Yeah, most, you know, exception I think is tomatoes. But most fruits and vegetables have heat, um, heat sensitive vitamins in there. And something like if you took carrots and you ate a carrot, you'd get 100% of the vitamin C and, and beta carotene. If you steamed it, it would knock it down. If you fried it, it would knock it down. If you microwave it, it's gone. And so most things, you're one going to eat at least 51% of your diet raw. That not only lowers and prevents uh, food allergens or food sensitivities, but it makes sure that the food's in the same form that it's supposed to, and you get the absolute most nutrition from that food. Does that mean? I have a question. Yes. I have a severe foot problem and on my toes. It's that chalky white stuff. Sometimes it's so painful, the only thing that helps it is soak them in hot water that I have. Um, and you said it's candida. It could and be. I heard lavender oil from Judy, uh, Judy it used to be here, mm -hmm. that it helps with uh, treaty oil. Right. Yeah, and there's, you know, it's, it's really wonderful. And, the, there's hundreds of herbs that are antifungal, anti-yeast, anti-parasitic. And so it's, it's not, uh, 
with these kind of things, we're not limited in what will work. There's, there's tons of things that will work. And so lavender is really good. Tea tree oil is one of the most potent, powerful, longest used. Uh, what about certain foods? For this. For reducing it, yeah. I mean, you're going to want to eat low glycemic, nutrient-dense foods. What's that? That's those foods that are on the green side of that, oh, yeah. that list. And so basically fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and greens in the raw form as much as possible. Yes, in the raw form. Right, right. Yes. Uh, how effective are veggie washes when it comes to reducing the, the pesticide uh, uh, residue on fruits and vegetables? Well, they're pretty good. Um, a lot of people like to do like a, a, a vinegar water wash. Or a grapefruit it's, seed extract or something like that. Yeah. They, yeah, there's several different kinds, and they all work really well. I mean, they're obviously going to be a lot better than <laughs> what you start with. So if you can't get or organic, that is a, an option. Right, right. Yeah, and a lot of times uh, you've got to take that wax off. Because they'll wax it so at least it looks kind of pretty, but when they put the wax on, they wax over all the other chemicals that are on there. So you want to use vinegar to get the wax off and then rinse them thoroughly. Yeah. In 25 words or less, can you give us your opinion of microwaves? <laughs> oh, that's an easy one. I, usually I can't do 25 words or less on anything. Uh, they're horrible, horrible. They uh, radiate food they were originally used to kill people. Um, and they, they knock out almost all the nutrition from food. People that microwave in any kind of plastic will release 500 times more estrogen uh, mimicking chemicals than what's required to cause breast cancer. There's more dioxin that is released than what DDT caused or had back when it was banned in 1972. They're horrible, horrible. They're great for storing stuff in, but not cooking. Well, how is it... Okay, I have a little great-grandson that's a year and a half, and his parents warm up his food in the microwave, and I told them not to do that. And they went to the doctor, and the doctor said it doesn't make any difference. How do you convince someone? I mean, it just... It's yeah, like, you know, it's, it's, that's a good question. I have the advantage a lot of times because um, I don't advertise or anything, so typically when somebody ends up on my doorstep, they're just ready to do whatever it takes. So they, a lot of times I don't get all the questioning, which is nice. Um, but otherwise, you would just say, well, here's my concern. Here's the studies that show this. And that's what I would do. Well, see, he's had health problems since day one, this little baby, okay? And right now, he still struggles. And, and that's another question. I noticed you said that about milk. What does a small child drink, you know, that drinks out of, the, out of the baby bottle. Yeah. What is a good... How old? A year and a half. I still should have some breast milk, and, and that boosts the immune system. Mom can pump if it's inconvenient. Um, but other than that, water is the main thing, and pureeing fruits is excellent. Okay. Probably... Get the mic over to her. Oh, Because I know that, you know, when I was a pediatric nurse, we put kids on, uh, on the soy milk products like Isomil if they couldn't handle or if they had GI problems as a result of milk. Yeah. Well, you know, the only thing that we're really designed to drink is breast milk. Mm -hmm. And even we can't even drink cow's milk or it'll destroy our kidneys, you know, that young. Um, and soy milk is just another kind of fake way to, you know, they grind soybeans up and they let the water drip out and it mm -hmm. looks milky and then we call it milk. Um, again, there's lots of, online, there's wonderful recipes for natural um, kind of mimics of breast milk. Mm -hmm. And so you get high nutrients. Now, most soy milk in the U.S. is genetically modified. Most soy is genetically modified, mm -hmm. which means, you know, they're Frankenstein genes that they, they put in there. Um, and we know that they cause more problems than benefits. And lot, there's a lot of soy allergens because of that, too. The, you know, the first genetically modified food that came out when I was just out of high school was uh, the Flavor Save tomato. 
-hmm. And the genetic modification of that disrupted the gut bacteria enough that bad bacteria proliferated, produced toxins, and killed a bunch of people. So they pulled it. Don't worry, they pulled it, and they came out with new stuff. So don't worry about that. What about storing uh, foods in plastic containers? No. Like I have to use just glass? Right. Yeah, canning jars are wonderful. Uh, all grandma's old school glass dishes that were colored are wonderful. Uh -huh. um, if you store in plastic, plastic is made from petroleum. And the food that we have in there will leach that, and we get dioxin, dioxins and, and estrogen, this is what's called xenoestrogens, or things that mimic estrogen. And, you know, it's just not worth it when we have all this glass. I mean, you go to Walmart and get Pyrex little dishes of all different sizes. Uh, but there, a few years ago, uh, through Harvard, Harvard's one of the first schools that, that said milk is not a part of a healthy diet. They're the richest school in the world now. They, they don't need milk lobby money, so they can say that. And they would talk about the dangers of cow milk and all the estrogens in there. And plastics are the same. Plastics are so bad. Um, the receipt, <laughs> this is a little bit scary, but the receipts that you get at like Walmart, they're coated with bisphenol A so that they, uh, I, don't know, they I don't know what it helps, but they're heat sensitive, I guess. Uh, but if a pregnant mom touches those with dry fingers, studies show she absorbs enough estrogen to change the developing fetus if it was going from, a, we all start as females and then we grow into males. And so it can arrest that process. It can actually arrest the process of the brains changing. And that's the same estrogens that are in the plastic. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I know there's uh, more than one person in this room that takes uh, pharmaceutical medicine. Uh, we think there's a difference between pharmaceutical medicine and some of the poisonous drugs. And we don't want to just get off of those medications. Right. If there's a way to improve health over time, I think it would be a common sense to you know, try the, the healthy way, but then slowly get off of those, if possible. Right. Because I think there's sometimes you can't get off of all of them. Yeah, and that's the reality is we, we, we make a choice. We're either going to choose drugs, supplements, or food and lifestyle. But don't get me wrong. You can't just keep what, doing what you're doing and just get off your drugs. There's a reason you have to take those to artificially make things, symptoms better, labs better, electrolytes better. You, you can get off those over time, but it's going to be through lifestyle changes. Some people can get off 10 drugs in, in a month. Some people takes a year. And a lot of that just has to do with the diet, but it has to be done in a very controlled um, atmosphere. Yeah. I just was wondering, what do you think of, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, attitude or attitudes about life on health? You know, I'm talking about like fear, worry, and of course oh, yeah. the things that, that how much how much you think they 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 affect actual overall health. You know, you, I know we have talked a lot about foods and things, but what yeah. about those kind of attitudes, deep, almost subconscious attitudes that, that we develop? And I noticed in our society, just in my lifetime, fear has increased immensely, and yeah. just fear all around all, all everything. And so I just, if you can address that, maybe a minute. No, that's a great that's a great topic. Uh, one of the Harvard Symposiums was about uh, voodoo medicine. And there was this idea, they were talking about how does voodoo medicine work in Haiti and, you know, what's its roots in the U.S. as far as how can we use that within how we think. And really voodoo medicine is you believe someone can make you a zombie so you become a zombie. It's that hypnotic subconscious thought. But the practicality of that within healthcare, Dr. Samuelson did this study where they took lab rats and they took the lab rats and they dropped them in a bucket of water. And the little lab rats just swam, 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 and drowned. They all drowned. Every single one of them drowned. That was the cause of death. They did the little vivisection. They all drowned. They took street rats. They threw them in that bucket, same bucket of water. And they just freaked out, freaked out, freaked out, and had a heart attack and then died. So what's the difference? They're both rats. One drowns. One has a heart attack. It died before it was going to die. 
The fear of death actually killed it before the water did. Have you guys ever heard that if you jump off a building, you actually die, like a skyscraper, not like a one story. But if you jump off a skyscraper, you actually die before you hit the ground. Oh, right. <laughs> and if, I don't know where, well, they, did, they found out on autopsy. Um, but it was, the impact of that is that people's mind can literally kill them. They are thinking themselves into a heart attack without actually having the pathology that's going to cause the heart attack. And so that's amazing. So can we think ourselves sick? Absolutely. We know that. But the other side's true, too. There's a great um, study on the placebo effect. And they gave people sugar pills, and people would get better. They did this study where they gave people 10-cent aspirin or $90 aspirin. It's the same aspirin, right? But they wouldn't tell them. Guess which study group got better? The $90 aspirin. Because if it costs that much, it must make me better. And guess what? The belief that I will get better made me better. The studies I love the most are the ones with diabetes. They give people a sugar pill. A sugar pill. And they say, if you eat this sugar pill, it will lower your blood sugar. Well, that makes no physiological sense. But it worked. And in fact, if they took that same pill and they made it bright blue, it worked better. <clears throat> if they made it bigger and called it controlled release or extended, it even worked better yet. If they charged more for it, it worked even better. And the thing about placebo is not that placebo is a fraud. It's we should embrace that idea that we can think ourselves better. Patients who are prayed for, that they know they are being prayed for, get better faster. So next time somebody's in the hospital, make sure they know you're praying for them, right? We can literally get better based on the belief. So can we think ourselves sick? Can we kill ourselves with our thoughts? Absolutely. But can we think ourselves better? Absolutely. And that's what I love. That, that's a wonderful question. Because attitude really does matter. I think we have four questions over on that side. Yeah. <laughs> My question is with distilled water, it comes in plastic containers. Oh, yeah. What's your suggestion about that? Well, there's now, luckily, there's like Evian. Have you guys had Evian? At the back of Walmart, through all the sodas, there's green bottles of Evian, which is water bottled from the depths of the earth in France. They put it in glass bottles. They ship it across the ocean, and it costs as much as tap water and plastic. And it's minerals. It has lots of minerals and nutrients and all those trace elements that you need that we don't have in our water system anymore. There's also aquapana. Aquapana is from S. Pellegrini, and it's in the same section. Pellegrini is from Naples, Italy. The other one is maybe from Venice, Italy. So you can be all highfalutin drinking your you know, Venetian water and... It's in glass, and it's from 1,500 feet under the ground. So it's super, super healthy. It's pH balanced, so it's carbonated a little bit, but usually carbonated is acidic stuff, which then causes osteoporosis. But this acidic carbonated stuff is balanced with other minerals, and so it's the same pH as your blood, so it's wonderful, wonderful. Um, aquapana. Oh, aquapana. Yeah, aqua like water and then Pana, P A N A. A glass bottle. Yeah. Distilled water in plastic is no good. No. Anything in plastic is no good. And in fact, you know, you'll get it in the freezer section of the store or the refrigerator section of the store, but it was in a hot, hot truck on the way. And during that hot, hot truck, it leached those chemicals in there. And in fact, um, you guys know who Cheryl Crow is? She's a singer. She got uh, breast cancer, and it was kind of interesting because she blamed the breast cancer on the water bottles. And I thought that was awesome because it got that message out that she said that when she leaves that water bottle in the car and it heats up, and then she puts it back in the fridge and it cools down, she's drinking estrogen that causes breast cancer. So that was wonderful to, to at least have someone highlighting that. 
Okay, this water that you're talking about, do you just find that in uh, health food stores? Or? No, no, Walmart. Oh, you can? It's like a buck 25, buck 50 or something for a big bottle of it. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Nowadays, the young men, and I have a couple of nephews that are doing this, they drink this whey stuff to build muscles and all that craziness. Is that, what's that doing to it? That's us? horrible. <laughs> so whey, now I get to use my chalkboard. So whey is the byproduct or waste product from cheese making from milk. You take mm -hmm. milk and you squeeze it really hard and the liquids le leak out and they would dump those out into the field and then they noticed the crops grew or the grasses in the field grew really tall there so they thought, hey, we should check this stuff out. That's just a bunch of protein, right? But here's the, here's the issue with those supplements. And we, I think we've had about two patients that were young men taking those that had behavior issues, sudden changes in behavior, depression, anxiety, all those. And in your gut, so you have your, those amino acids from there. And you have little receptors, little doorways, and then those doorways then push certain amino acids into your blood. And then you get to use those things. Well, something like tryptophan, which you know what tryptophan, anybody know where tryptophan's from? <laughs> turkey, right? You eat your turkey, you get tired. That's not really true because it's actually the blood goes from the brain to the stomach from Thanksgiving. That's what really makes you tired, not the tryptophan. But tryptophan becomes 5-HTP. And then it becomes serotonin. And then that becomes melatonin. And there will be a test over this. <laughs> serotonin, this is food. This is sleep, or sorry, mood and behavior. So mood and behavior, serotonin. And this is sleep and your circadian rhythm, melatonin. It comes from tryptophan. If you use whey protein, which has a bunch of bulk amounts of amino acids that aren't going to be the same as the ones that you eat in your diet, then these non-selective doorways will just take a certain amount of amino acids, it doesn't care which 20 they are, and then it stops absorbing them and shuts those doors. So if you're taking a protein powder that's usually like for bodybuilders, they're using lots of arginine, uh, and carnitine, then you absorb less tryptophan. Then you have behavior changes. You have sleep problems. And you can literally, literally cause a schizophrenic type of behavior or a bipolar type of behavior or a mood disorder by disrupting the balance of amino acids. Okay. So yeah, way, way ones are way bad. It's just a way that they're going to make a lot of money off something they used to throw away. Well, they've convinced these young men that they're going to have all these muscles if yeah. they drink all this stuff. And yeah, because that's what the horse does. He drinks a bunch of whey right. and gets all these muscles. Okay, I have two more questions. The next one is, what's your opinion of frozen fruits and vegetables? Uh, because they put those in plastic bags. That's how they package them. Yeah, you know, and that's the same thing we, we have with patients with uh, wild-caught fish. They're always in plastic, you know. The frozen's going to be, you know, it's always uh, <laughs> weighing the good versus the bad. The good that comes from all the nutrition in there, and it's frozen when it's packaged, it's less likely to absorb that plastic. So that's going to be usually a very least toxic situation. The other thing is the stuff that's frozen is usually because it's already ripe. It's not going to survive the shipments, mm -hmm. right? You know, most of your bananas that you eat are up to three years old. Um, a watermelon, or say a potato can be up to eight years old by the time you see it in the grocery store. Apples can be up to five years old. Um, and so things that are too ripe when they pick them, they don't want to waste that. So they freeze them. They flash freeze them. And you actually will get more nutrition because uh, so Harvard did the study where they picked uh, store-bought store tomatoes versus vine-ripened ones. And there was 241 missing nutrients in the store-bought because they pick them green, gas them, they look like they're ripe, and you bite into the peach or the tomato, and there's no juice. <laughs> like when you're a kid, right? You bite into it, it just drips all over. 
There's no juice anymore because you're eating green stuff that's gas to look like it's real stuff. The frozen stuff is most often stuff that was really ripe. And that's going to have a lot more nutrition in it. And it's going to be worth it, even if it's in plastic. Okay. And then uh, do you have any particular research or anything on cell phones and how they're affecting oh, yeah. people's health? Yeah, you know, you guys don't want to know this. Uh, cell phones, there's a world study of 16 different nations, and they all independently study the risk of cell phones with cancer on children and adults. And what they, in they, they, 2010, they presented to the United States Senate, um, and basically they just said, it's not a, a question anymore. People who have brain cancers, it's always on the side of cell phone use. We know that you can measure, they use little special cameras, they can see the electromagnetic uh, interference that goes into the brain. Uh, there's a study that shows that cows under, it's from the EPA, that cows under high voltage power lines, that the electricity from there can disrupt the brain neurochemicals in, in the cow and make it actually go insane. Mm. But they said, don't worry, it probably won't happen to people. We need more research. And so the cell phones are not only bad for us, but it's going to go all the way through the brain because the, the bones are so thin for children. So that's the wonderful benefit of these kids using texting is because texting spends a lot less time with their head next to this electromagnetic ray there. Um, and then the, you can also get air tubes, which you plug into your cell phone and then you put into your ears, and it's just air conducting that, that voice and back and forth. And so that's going to be a safe way. And then there's also things that you can put on the back of your phone so you don't get hip cancer, pelvic cancer, or femur cancer, because they see those trends too. Dr. Garrett, in answer to Jim's question when he asked about uh, medications that people were taking, yeah. you, you seem to imply in your answer that regardless of your ailment, you could cure it with food. Is that your contention? I have every belief in that. Regardless of what your ailment is, you yeah. can cure it with diet. Yeah. And that's just because we see it all the time, uh -huh. you know? And that's what even uh, our nurse in the beginning, she was just like, mm, no, 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 no. And it's just, just watch, just watch. Convention says it isn't going to work, but I'm telling you, this will work. And it works. Now, the biggest determinant isn't me or physiology. It's what will the patient do. So if the patient lives a lifestyle that's consistent with life and longevity, the body works and everything goes back to normal. If they don't, then they have to take a medication. Does that make sense? So no. if you keep putting water in your gas tank, you got to keep buying the anti-knock formula. But the body will heal. So think of like a, a patient who smokes, smokes. It takes 10 years to reverse all that genetic mutation and a person that stops smoking 10 years later is considered a non-smoker again. They reversed all the genetic mutation. They get all their lung capacity back. What about the BPA-free plastic? Yeah, you know, we always do this in the U.S. We poison someone and then they get, say, ooh, there's poison, and they go, well, let's change the poison to something else. Um, you guys ever watch a show called How's It Made? Uh, I think it's a nice Canadian show. But it shows you the whole process from beginning to end, how they make stuff, like everything. It's a wonderful show. If you need sleep, it'll make you go to sleep. If you want to learn, you learn. Um, but in there, it's kind of cool because they show you how they make canned goods and bottled goods. And they're like, now we spray this on here to prevent rust. And it's like, wait, what's that spray? Right? And then they say, well, to prevent, to prevent this or this, we spray this on it. And it's like, well, no, wait, what's that spray? And so, you know, they're spraying all these things on our canned goods. And even though it's BPA-free, that's probably better, but there's still some type of co coating on there. And, in fact, they switched it to BPS now. So now we get another plastic in there, and then we wait until a bunch of people get sick, and then we alarm, become alarmist for that. The crazy thing is you can look at the FDA. The FDA will say, we need more research to see if this is safe. And then you look at the EPA, and the EPA is is using our taxes to warn us not to consume those things that the FDA approved, right? 
So things, it doesn't matter which plastic they use, and especially because of the recycling, we actually are getting those BPAs in everything. It's going to be really hard to, to get rid of it. Plastic, if you look at the bottom of plastic, you know, there's a little triangle, recycle triangle. Uh, three and seven are your most toxic, your most xenoestrogenic. But all the others are still estrogenic. They're still endocrine disruptors, you know. Yes? Just a quick one back to the cell phone. Uh, what, um, what's the difference in, uh, in you know, you're receiving the cell phone signal? And, and you got the cell phone, it's all around us. Yeah. What's, what's, the, what's the difference, I guess, uh, if you can address that? Well, because the, I don't know if you've ever used your cell phone long enough that you, your ears start sweating. It produces oh, a lot. That happens when it's nine degrees outside. <laughs> <laughs> it produces a lot of heat, you know, and it's, that's just part of that. But the electromagnetic part, when you put that to your ear, is greater than what's out here. So it's part of the reception part. Because, yeah, you can take anybody's cell phone and and basically put it next to your head and hear anybody's conversation. But it's your cell phone that's emitting the electric uh, magnetic frequency from interpreting that and, and producing sound and all that. I'd kind of like to go back to what John was talking about on this. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us that if we'll obey God's eight health laws, we'll get all these blessings. And I think this kind of applies if if we obey what the doctor tells us to do, if it's, if it's truly right, then we'll get all these benefits. Right. So if, if we eat like we should and obey the eight laws of health that we've shared before, we're going to get the benefits. But it takes time. You just, like somebody brought up earlier, it's slower to heal things naturally. Yeah. 